My spirit was shaken. I was angered, repulsed, and many other verbs I can't even articulate. Seeing tape of yet another unarmed black man on the street pinned to the ground, crying out for his mother, crying out, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. We've heard those words too many times before. People of color and allies taking to the street to make their collective voices heard, calling out the name George Floyd and others whose lives have been taken by racism and police brutality. In preparing for this show, I realized it would be impossible to broach what has transpired in this country in one single episode. So this is the first of multiple. My guests today are two college students, one black, one white, each on the protest front lines. Up next, their perspectives on this RXG exclusive. We must open up our minds and take a look inside. I bet we find we hold all the answers tonight. You're watching RXG exclusives. Oh, they tried to keep us away. Malik, you are the epitome of an overachiever, but that's a great thing, not a bad thing. At the age of 17, you graduated high school one year early, and you're not merely just a full-ride student at North Carolina A&T State University. You held the title of Mr. Freshman, and you're gearing up for your sophomore year. Zachary Lingley is a writer, documentarian, and passionate and knowledgeable about American and world history. He's a freshman at the University of Delaware, and you're majoring in... Uh, international relations and French and political science. Uh, the French and political science sounds like a, a triple major, but they're combined, so it's just a double major. Now, I just want to roll back and ask you about your experiences as an HBCU student at the North Carolina A&T. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so honestly, I grew up I grew up in a predominantly white area. I've always been in touch with the culture because I've been surrounded by my family and my church and all of that. But in terms of school, I've always gone to predominantly white schools. That's just how it folded. I went to Grassville High School, nothing against Grassville High School, but I've always gone to predominantly white high schools. And so of course, the topic of HBCU isn't really stressed at all. Um, we don't get much experience with HBCUs coming from a predominantly white high school. And so A&T, honestly, it was on my radar, but A&T and Howard were the only two HBCUs I applied to, only probably because of the lack of education that I had about the power of HBCUs, honestly, which is something I didn't completely realize until I started attending. But once A&T offered me the full ride, I just knew that was a sign that's where I needed to be. Um, I went to A&T and I would say it's the best experience of my life and it's the best decision I made in my life. Just being around so many other people that look like me, but are so different at the same time. I think that's that's what I've learned the most, that like, while we're all black, we're still all different. Um, Cause I think society tries to group black people into being one, two or three certain ways, drug dealers, sports players, or other negative things, you know? And so um, I think what being at my HBCU really taught me was that we're all different, but we're all here for the same goal, uh, which is to thrive in whatever our whatever we're doing. And I think that's what HBCs are so important for. It's a safe space for us to really thrive and come into our own together. The support is unmatched. Like if if anyone at Anti has any type of business, 95% of the campus will retweet your business. They'll tell their friends about it. If they have the money, they'll support it just because that's how the culture is. And I'm sure it's like that at many HBCUs that just, we're all there to help each other succeed and get to that next step in our lives, whatever that is. Your, your freshman year in college, will be an extremely memorable one because the school year was interrupted by a global health crisis. Uh, tell me what you were experiencing, particularly on campus at the onset of the pandemic, and how you've been managing self-quarantine slash isolation. I will say the pandemic probably came at the worst time possible. The energy on campus around, I don't even know, was it March? Was March when COVID started? Yeah, it was. Well, that's when the you-know-what hit the fan, but I heard about it as early as December 
thirtieth, thirty first. But well, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so what I'm, yeah, I meant that. Like when we got started getting sent at home. So yeah, March. I would say the energy on campus was unmatched. I don't know. It was just something about everyone. Everyone was starting to come together. Uh, positive vibes everywhere. Everyone was starting to handle their business. I seen so much good news from my fellow students on Twitter, just about them maybe getting internships or businesses they were starting. Like everything was going so great. COVID came and kind of just like wrecked all of that. But one thing I'll say is that NCAT has, for the most part, managed to stay connected and unified throughout the whole time. And I think that's something that COVID has, that's a positive in the whole negative situation is that we've seen that we can all still come together and be together through a bad time like this. In the midst of us all learning how to adapt to this new normal, wearing masks, washing our hands, practicing social distancing, people of color and allies were shocked at yet another act of police brutality. Now in 2015, amid the aftermath of Freddie Gray's death, Baltimore mom Toya Graham was filmed smacking her 16-year-old son on the street because he was reportedly engaged in riotous behavior. Five years later, we have the George Floyd case. African Americans and allies took to the streets all over this country and perhaps all over this world. Your mother marched right alongside you. Uh, what made you want to participate in the Virginia Beach demonstrations and did your mom have any reservations about you taking part? And how did you socially distance among the hundreds if not thousands of participants? Okay, so since the protest start, well, since, since the issue happened, me and my friends have, we always talk about certain things that are going on. That's something that's been heavy on our hearts, just the whole situation. And so from that point, we knew we wanted to do something to play our part and show that we were supporting of the movement, you know? And so me and my friends have been talking all week about possibly going to a protest. And my mom was with her friends and they said they wanted to go. So she just sent me a text. She was like, we're going to the protest in Virginia Beach tonight. Get ready. I'm like, okay, so we're gonna go to the protest in Virginia Beach. I, I wanted to go anyway, so I'm excited at this point. I tell some of my friends, uh, when I get out there, they're already out there, already going at it. And I'm like, wow. So, yeah, so I get out there and one of my best friends, he's actually going to Antti next year. Uh, he's he's at the front of the march, like in front of hundreds of people leading it. And so I fall right in line with him. Um, we, we have our masks on, of course, because we're trying to be safe. But at that point, I think people... While people, COVID is still the issue, like there's a bigger issue. Okay, and I'm gonna assume that you're not African American. <laughs> uh, I feel like that's a pretty safe assumption. So what made you decide to participate in the Philadelphia George Floyd protests and how did you practice social distancing? I, um, so I'm just straight up, it was impossible to practice social distancing while protesting. Um, but if, I mean, the protests were very important and I've been practicing social distancing. So I, you know, breaking it for a couple hours didn't seem too troublesome to me, uh, at least for like my safety personally. And so people, people weren't even worried about COVID. Everyone's standing hand in hand, dapping each other up, high-fiving, uh, yelling right next to each other because it shows just how powerful and how much of an issue we are dealing with right now. And that uh, it's even more important than COVID. So it was beautiful being out there. Uh, it really left a mark on me just seeing so many people come together, people of different races, uh, different ages, ethnicities, all of that. Just everyone coming together for one common goal. And the fact that it was peaceful for over two hours also just showed that like we're out there doing the right thing and people were out there for the right reasons. The general consensus is that these protests were peaceful until outside agitators infiltrated and sometimes even the police themselves. Malik, what gives? Okay, so I don't, I won't go too far into this, but I will say yes, like, and I'll just speak for what I was a part of. In Virginia Beach, everything was peaceful. When I was there, everyone had their signs, we're taking knees, all of that. But the riots themselves, or the protests that they start, started off as in Philadelphia, um, so there was one protest that started at noon that wasn't officially part of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And so I went to that one first and then Black Lives Matter, they had their official protest um, at the art museum down the street officially at two. So I started walking over there a bit before that. And both of these events were in Philadelphia's center city section, correct? Yeah, no, they all ended up at a city hall. So they were like right there at Left Park and such. I actually left around 
10 o'clock and the tear gas and all that didn't start until uh, 10 30 but i did speak to some people that were still out there and for what i understand protesters were trying to leave but once again i'm i can't speak too much on something that i wasn't exactly directly a part of but yeah from what i've seen actually just on tv now i just watched this live dc they're all of them are peacefully protesting and the military police continue to tear gas them push them back while they were being peaceful so at that point if people choose to retaliate after they've tried to be peaceful i can, i can only sympathize with them because they tried being peaceful and that didn't work so they need to result in something else maybe maybe what they're doing isn't right either but at least they're trying something else instead of keep trying what's causing them to be oppressed in the first place now going back to the protest when you first arrived on the scene did you feel a sense of fear or concern and when things shifted i, I know you took a picture of a burning car when you were leaving. Did you feel that you needed to leave as soon as possible? What, what was the scene like? All right, so, so back to like the timing of everything. So the Black Lives Matter protest began a bit before two, and I was there for about an hour, hour and a half. Then I went back inside. Uh, my mom lives in Center City, so I was visiting her for the weekend. And so that's, she and I both went to the protest for that amount of time, then we went back inside. And so that was when they were tremendously peaceful and everything. And then around 5, 5.30, maybe 6 is when um, the cars started to, uh, then police cars started to be uh, set on fire in the streets. Um, I think it was about four or five in total that, that I saw personally. Uh, so for the first part of the protest, it was extraordinarily peaceful. But as we started leaving, we were marching along with the entire group to City Hall, which is where the protest was kind of shifting from the art museum down the street. And oh, for, for, for you that, if you don't know, I'm not from Philly, so I don't know names of art museums and things. I'm from no. Dallas, Texas. So, um, oh. so as we were walking to City Hall, there were um, people within the crowd who were um, kind of they were obviously not with Black Lives Matter, and it seemed that they weren't really supporting the message of Black Lives Matter because you saw all sorts of, um, you know, communist, anarchist flags, you know, um, well, but like group, like people, if you saw them, you would attribute them to being part of Antifa, but like I, I can't say for sure that they were a part of it. Um, but like, if you were to envision an Antifa person in your mind, this is what they would look like. And the thing is, from the people that I saw personally, that I took the time to look at as they were waving all these flags and shouting things that weren't necessarily in line with what Black Lives Matter was trying to accomplish, 100% of the people I saw that were doing these things were white. Not even not black people, like not even, you know, any Hispanic people or Asians, 100% of these people who were agitating the crowd were white hmm. so uh, my mom and i went inside at that point and then around five or six is when things started getting really bad so my car was actually out on the street and i just wanted to move it um a bit farther away from the protest for obvious reasons and that is i was just passing so those pictures i took and those videos i took that was just me passing by but like in that moment i personally didn't feel any fear for anything or for myself personally um, it, it was actually kind of calm, like, like I, like you still, I'm sure you saw the video. I was passing right by a cafe where they were breaking the windows, people were running in. And I never once thought that, you know, I would get caught up in anything. Um, so me personally, I did feel pretty safe for a lack of a better term. Um, but when police started moving in to get around City Hall, when City Hall itself, like the windows are being broken and such, that's when I got out of there. There was video in Atlanta of police forcibly removing a Spelman student and a Morehouse student from a vehicle during protests. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah. I've watched it several times, multiple angles, the fear on that young woman's face, the confusion and panic on that young man's face. As of this interview, I don't have the details, but what I saw was disturbing. And that's the that's the problem. Like the police are literally here to to protect the people. 
So there should be no point where people are fearful of the police because they're trying to drive home and they see the police and they don't know what's going to happen to them. Those two kids were just driving home, literally just driving home, following the curfew orders by going back home. They could have been staying out, but they chose to drive home. As they followed the orders that were placed upon them, they still end up being a system, being a victim of the system. So at that point, it just makes people feel like they can't win. They do what's wrong and they get oppressed. They do what's right and they still get oppressed. And I feel like that's the problem. Which leads me to my next question. As a young man of color, are you afraid of the police? I would say I'm not afraid because I don't want to live in fear. Uh, only thing I fear is God. But um, I wouldn't say I'm afraid, but I definitely have to be more cautious than maybe I was a few years ago. Uh, definitely now because I'm driving my own car. Uh, I'm 18, I'm 5'11". So the police might see a black man that's 5'11 in a car, in a halfway decent car, and automatically assume that I'm a threat just because of my appearance. And so I wouldn't say I'm afraid of the cops, but I'm definitely much more cautious when I'm around them. And last night when I was at the protest, definitely was always keeping an eye on me, watching my back, uh, just making sure nothing was happening to me or the people around me at the hands of the cops. Now, there are many organizations, entities, and groups whose mission is fighting for the justice and equality for people of color. Groups like the NAACP and Black Lives Matter. But an actual leader in this young people of color movement, if you will, seems non-existent. Would that be a fair assessment? Is there someone bringing young people of color together with specific demands and strategies, or is it every young man or woman for themselves? I wouldn't say that it's every man and woman for themselves, but at the same time, I don't think there's one central leader. At that point, any leadership, any obvious leadership in uh, by City Hall, I can't speak for you know, other parts of the city because there were other streets around us, there was no obvious leadership. It, there was at the art museum, but as sometime in between there and the walk to City Hall, and then the descent into the riots, there was a complete lack of leadership there. But there's definitely people that are out there trying to play that role, people that are doing what's necessary, people leading the marches. Like there were three or four people that were the definitely the spearheads and the, the main figures that, that led our march last night. And you could tell that they made sure everything was, they made sure to their ability everything was going as planned. Uh, there were a few times when people from the outside were trying to aggravate us and make us react so that it would assume that we sort of would seem as if we're being violent. That happened three times to my knowledge where people, I literally saw a man grab a woman and throw her to the ground, a woman that was protesting. He literally grabbed her and threw her to the ground. And of course, us protesters, we riot, like we didn't, we, we crowded the area, but no one laid a hand on him. Uh, hopefully the police deal with him properly. But yeah, we were continuing to be peaceful and so like i'm saying there are people definitely that are leading the way within their own communities there may not be one main black person that's wrangling the whole country together and maybe that's what we need but there's definitely people that are playing their role and doing their part to show their leadership in the best way possible now justice equality and eradicating racism all together are an overall goal but each time an unarmed man who looks like you or i is killed we have panels and debates and town halls. There are talks of community and police gatherings. But I think it's safe to say that many young people of color are fed up with the talk. They want action. In your opinion, are there specific goals that protesters want? And if so, what are they? I think we want justice. And what that means is there shouldn't be a question. When situations like uh, these are happening, the cops should be fired and put in jail immediately there shouldn't even be a question of oh maybe it was an accident especially when it's being videotaped like there should be no question and so i think what we first want is justice and beyond that we want to live in a world where we aren't scared to look behind our back every five minutes because we saw a cop or we're scared that next time we see a cop we're going to be the next person dying at the hands of them. is it important in your opinion for non-people of color to not just speak up about racial injustice, but actually be physically in the fight as well. If it's just people of color that, you know, support all these things, then since they're, since they are marginalized, it's hard for those marginalized voices to make themselves known. So it is up to white people to help amplify those voices because the fact of the matter is, is that we live in a conservative country, even though, you know, we may have a democratic Congress here and there, a democratic president, our country is overall very conservative even sometimes when we have a Democrat in office or at various positions all over the electoral boards. So 
the thing is that sometimes we like for every social policy that's ever been enacted in this country we've needed to get conservatives to agree and to come over and vote on these things if you have you know racists in office and it's just marginalized groups speaking out then the way racists will try to turn that is well of course you're going to say these things because it benefits you but if white people start to speak out about these things things that don't directly benefit them then it applies more legitimacy to it in the eyes of you know racist politicians so that's a very important thing to do zachary do you believe the current administration is racist uh, i mean yes trump himself and many of the people under him yes but to apply that to every member of the administration is of course always you know a bit out there but yes the current national security advisor said this on cnn and i quote i don't think there's systemic racism i think 99 percent of our law enforcement officers are great americans there is no doubt that there are some racist people i think they're the minority would you agree that there's no systemic racism within the united states police system I think it may be safe to say it's the minority, but it's definitely not 99% to one. If anything, it might be 51, 49, or 60, 40, 70, 30. But to say that there's no systemic racism in America is, that's an ignorant state. No, there definitely is. Um, Cause the thing they always use, um, the bad apples analogy, they always use that, but they never use the whole phrase, which is one bad apple ruins the bunch. And plus like, the other 99% of cops usually protect and, you know, circle around their, those that have committed these, what they are, crimes and murders in terms of, you know, committing pre police brutality all over the country. So, I mean, of course there are good people who are cops, but the police force as a whole does support a system of racism. Often these conversations built around protest and police brutality lead some to explain that not all cops are bad. Is it necessary to explain that, or should it be implied that protesters are speaking to a particular group? Yeah, people bring up that argument, but the thing is the protesters understand that too. For instance, yesterday when we were protesting, we, there were literally cops alongside of us, a few cops alongside of us, and a few cops in front of us to make sure, like, that the way was clear and things of that nature. It wasn't until the cops started not, what's the word? They weren't cooperating with us, I guess they would say. Like there was a time when they were letting us do what we do, but eventually I guess they got tired of seeing so many of us out there and they started acting a different way. And that's when things turned left. But we all understand that not every cop is bad. I don't think that's something that, like that argument is, is constantly brought up, but that shouldn't be an argument. Cause I think we all understand that. With groups or taglines like Blue Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, and All Lives Matter, are there people out there who are ignorant to what Black Lives Matter actually means? Yes, and they're just trying to do anything to undermine what we're doing. Um, this is an example that I see all over the place um, when, this, when this conversation comes up. But they say that if you're at a table and everyone's eating and one person isn't eating, you should point out that that person doesn't have any food. After pointing out that person doesn't have any food, you don't go around and say, well, everyone should have food because everyone else already has food. Black lives are the ones that are being taken right now. So that's the ones we're focusing on. If this was happening to other people as often and there was no repercussions, uh, the people aren't getting arrested for it, then the following actions would, the same actions would occur for them. But because black lives are the ones that are suffering at the hands of police brutality the most, and there's no justice for it in most cases, that's why we say black lives matter. And we're gonna keep saying it until everyone realizes. Do you feel that there's a difference between the civil rights era of now and the civil rights era of yesteryear? Because there seems to be a disconnect between young people and those who came before. I, only because I wasn't there, um, I can't completely compare the two, um, obviously. But yeah, I definitely see what you're saying. There, there really is a disconnect between the younger generation of uh, black people and the older generation. I was just saying this earlier today. And if we can't, find a way to unify completely between ourselves is going to be hard to get anyone else to completely respect us and unify with us. And so I feel like there has to be some sort of understanding between the older generations and the younger generations, which has come, you see people of all ages out there together protesting, but at the same time, you still see people, older, older um, African-Americans speaking down on us, calling us ignorant 
or careless uh, because we're out there, because people are out there rioting. Um, but if that's how they want to show their anger, it comes to a point where you can't tell someone how to show their anger. Because once someone gets so mad, they're going to do what they're going to do. I know I said that the older generation sometimes doesn't understand us, but I also think that the younger generation, we do have to do a better job of listening to the older generation and taking what they say to heart when we act in whatever we do as well. Now, I know you're well-rounded and informed, not just of what's happening here in the U.S., but globally. How do these recent protests compare to those in other places, and, and what can we all learn from each other? So the two areas of the world that I know mostly outside the U.S. are the Middle East and uh, Eastern Europe, specifically Ukraine. And there is a definite parallel that you can make between the Arab Spring and then the uh, Euromaidan protests that took place in Ukraine in 2014, because social media has made it very easy for social movements to connect with each other and organize a lot better, but it has also made it a lot easier for authorities to monitor it. Because, I mean, you can't publicly organize something without, I mean, the government or authorities seeing it. So it is kind of, so it, these obviously haven't, even at their current stage, these have gotten nowhere near as violent as Ukraine, Kiev, Ukraine did in 2014 or a Damascus, Syria did in 2011. Um, am I going to try to act like I can predict if it's going to go that way? No. I don't think anybody can because to compare, you know, American politics to, you know, other social movements around the world is kind of hard sometimes. Um, but there is a definite parallel, as I said, between the rise of social media and its importance in just social movements as a whole, because it allows everybody on all sides to just be more organized. It's a, a global pandemic, racial uprising. Where do we find the hope? Where do you find the hope? Honestly, I would be pretty pessimistic about the situation if it wasn't an election year. Like, this happening right before November 2020 does actually look pretty hopeful to me personally because it means that this will not disappear under, an, under more new cycles. Like the less new cycles there are between massive issues and elections, the more those issues will have an impact on the election. So I think the more people remember this in their very recent memory, the more it will take an impact at the polls. And with the way Trump is handling it, like I saw his address uh, yesterday to the nation, um, I think this is going to be a pretty, I think going, we can be pretty hopeful about November. That doesn't mean, you know, like, Oh, if everybody else is voting, I don't need to go vote. Every vote matters. But I think I'm more positive about when November comes around and when, if Biden wins, there will be these issues that we we're talking about right now will be addressed because they will be just so recent in, in everybody's minds. Voting is very important because that's the way to change the system through the system. Uh, protesting all of that is changing the system through our way. but. I think we have to attack at all angles. And so protesting um, and making our voices heard this way is one way to do that. But I think if we all come together and we all actually vote, we'll be attacking them from two different ways. And that's going to be much more powerful. I definitely say that people need to, as much as they can, try to spend time with their families. I feel like that's a good way to stay positive. Uh, something that should be able to put a smile on your face or your friends, whoever, whoever it is that can put a smile on your face, definitely spend time and cherish those moments. Because in the world that we live in now, you never know how many more moments of, the, of that that you have, honestly, because someone's life can be gone so quick. Malik Hawkins, sophomore at North Carolina A&T, and Zachary Lingley, freshman at the University of Delaware. I'm Robert X. Goffin, and this has been an RXG exclusive. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. I'm tired of injustice. I'm tired of the scheme. Your lies are disgusting, well, what does it mean? You're kicking me down, I've got a rise up, as jacked as it sounds, your whole system sucks, ache in the shadow, 
step into the light Telling me I'm wrong well, Here's a chance to prove you're right You sold your soul But I care about mine I'm gonna get stronger and I'll never give up the fight I'm tired of you telling the story your own way You're causing confusion and you think it's okay Well, you're changing rules While I play your games I can't take it much longer I, I just might go insane No, oh my God, can't believe what I saw As I turned on the TV This evening I was disgusted By injustice And it makes me want to scream 